As should be clear by now, Adam Smith's idea that a completely unregulated, totally free market in which business owners could pursue profits however they wanted did not actually work out super well for society as a whole in practice. It was cruel to the working class. It had huge environmental costs. Something had to give. So out of this awful situation that the working class found itself in in the industrial era arose two proposals to make their lives and society better, two reform movements, socialism and labor unions. So today we're going to be looking at both and look at how they proposed to fix some of the inequalities created by the capitalist industrial system. For context, remember that at this time, the norm was to work 11 to 14 hour days, six days a week. Um, child labor was totally normal. There was no public education or health care or disability insurance, no minimum wage laws, basically no protections for the worker in the industrial economy. Capitalism, in short, did not spark joy for the vast numbers of people living in cities working to the bone in factories and just barely surviving off of their labor. So what could be done to fix this problem? Labor unions proposed one answer. A labor union is an organization that represents a specific group of workers and their demands and tries to leverage their strength in numbers to improve their working conditions and improve society. Labor unions sought to reform the capitalist industrial system without having to fundamentally change the structures that created it. So it didn't require a totally different economic system or a totally different form of government in order to make the system better through labor unions. Labor unions instead sought to empower workers and address the problems of industrial life, like unsafe working conditions, long hours, child labor, low pay, etc., and secure more rights and better working conditions through collective bargaining, strikes, and democratic reform. Collective bargaining is negotiations between a, an employer, a boss, a business owner, and union representatives that represent massive groups of workers in any given industry. And they negotiate together pay and working conditions so that the union representatives can say like, hey, look, we have massive amounts of people and we're all going to stop working if we can't come to an agreement. The idea here is that where a boss can maybe ignore the demands of one worker at a time, together, collectively, workers can find a big source of strength. Now, labor unions in the United States are not incredibly strong and they're not a huge feature of our life, but in other parts of the world, they absolutely are and they are really effective at getting change and protection for workers. On your screen, you're seeing some pictures from France. France has some of the most organized unions in the world. Um, they can call a general strike, for example, which is when not only do workers stop working, but they all go out into the streets and protest and manifest demanding what they want. Doing this not only signals their power in numbers, but it also completely disrupts the working of the city. And so they get strength and more leverage the longer they do this. They've been successful at changing their retirement in age in France, for example, and getting all sorts of other reforms through. So collective bargaining um, can be really effective because together, collectively, workers have a lot more power than they have on their own. Um, when employers don't make the changes that the workers wanted through collective bargaining, workers could go on strike. That means they all refuse to work, which grinds business to a halt. So already the business owner is losing money. But if they do this in mass, they can cause bigger social and political problems, adding urgency to kind of meet them halfway and agree to their demands. This promotes change at the industry level. So like all of the public transportation workers might get together and go on strike and public transportation workers might get something out of it. 
it does not require a change to the government or the whole economic system. So like a transportation worker strike won't necessarily affect working conditions at textile factories unless all of the workers in a whole state organize. That's a lot harder to do. The idea though, the basic idea is that while a business owner can ignore one worker, he can't ignore them all. The trick is getting them all to agree to take the risk to go on strike, because if they can all be replaced, then this doesn't work so well. However, labor unions were incredibly effective, both back then and today, over time, of course. Um, as a result of union activities in the 20s and 1820s and 30s, parliaments, the British Parliament investigated child labor. Um, in 1833, the Factory Act made it illegal to hire a child under nine years old and made, made it illegal to make ages nine to 12 work more than eight hours a day. I laugh because that's still like a lot for a little kid, but you know. Um, in 1842, the Mines Act prevented women and children from working underground. And in 1847, the 10 Hours Act limited the workday to 10 hours. Since then, unions have secured even more rights for workers and for society as a whole. Um, examples from France include the right to a weekend. A two day weekend was a right that workers had to fight for. It wasn't given. In France, the work week is 35 hours tops, and it's illegal for employers to email employees outside of business hours. Um, they have guaranteed vacation, maternity leave for like a year. Here it's three to six weeks if you're lucky. Um, globally, and in the United States too, we can thank a union for the Family Medical Leave Act, paved sick leave, child labor laws, social security, minimum wage, the eight hour workday, overtime pay, um, health and safety protections, health care, dental, vision, insurance, um, breaks like legally mandated breaks, wrongful termination laws, age discrimination laws, raises, sexual harassment laws, the American Disabilities Act, holiday pay, military leave, Equal Pay Act, civil rights and workers compensation all kinds of things that we tend to take for granted, especially things like weekends, right? But that workers had to earn by putting their jobs on the line, taking a risk, going on strike, and demanding better conditions for themselves. There are limitations to this, however, in that the protections mostly apply to workers. It doesn't solve huge social problems created by capitalism. It doesn't solve the inherent like moral issues of a system that enriches very few people off of the labor of the many, using society's resources to benefit a few rich people instead of society as a whole. And as stated pre previously, um, labor union activities specifically when they're in one business or another tend to help only a few workers at a time, not create systematic change for the better. For systematic change for the better, we need to look at the rise of socialism. Socialism is an economic ideology like capitalism that changes the goal of economic activity. Capitalism's goal, remember, is to make profits for business owners. The goal of socialism is for society as a whole to benefit more from the resources and work that society put in. Socialism is also a word that is pretty charged and is pretty often misused because in its attempt to create a less unequal, more fair, more humane world for workers, it threatens the pocketbooks of some very rich, some very t powerful people. And so you'll hear, um, you'll hear lots of things referred to as socialism that don't actually quite fit the bill. So we're going to look at both definitions and also how socialism aimed to fix the problems that were created by a totally free market capitalism. First and foremost, have a look at these pictures. On the left, you see images of a working class. On the right, you see images of the upper class that enjoyed a life of leisure and enriched themselves off of the work of the, the workers. 
have a really good look at both of these images and remember that these people were sharing a city. They could see each other. Morally, it's wrong for some people to work 16 hour days to the bone and still potentially starve to death and barely make enough to, to live on while other people don't work at all and have none, none of these sorts of material problems. Politically though, massive inequality like this, where there's a huge visible difference between the people who have the most and the people who have the least, is pretty politically dangerous. Um, there's a huge potential for violence, especially when the masses of poor people have reason to be particularly angry about something or find themselves in a specifically um, desperate situation. The thing about inequality created by capitalism like this is that it's still with us. Um, on the slide now, you'll see some images from today. Escaping poverty requires almost 20 years with nearly nothing going wrong, and that doesn't tend to happen, right? So like the myth of the American dream is that if you work hard and you study, anybody can, you know, make, make it big in America. But in reality, that's a lot harder than we're told that it is. The flip side is huge amounts of inequality that a lot of people don't even realize the extent of. Look at the number line on the top right. A billion dollars is a lot more money than a lot of people think it is. And this country has several billionaires. 42 people in the world hold the same amount of wealth as 3.7 billion poorest people in the world. The combined, world's, uh, the combined wealth of the world's 22 richest men is more than the wealth of all the women in Africa. Um, if you saved $10,000 a day since the building of the pyramids of Egypt, you would still only have a fifth the average fortune of the five richest billionaires. The world's richest 1% have more than twice as much wealth as 6.9 billion people. That kind of inequality is so staggering, it is hard to get our minds around it. And it is something that the richest people in the world spend a lot of time and energy protecting. I'm prefacing our lesson on socialism because you will hear it misused in the news a lot. People talk about the word socialism like it means just giving unemployed lazy people who have no inkling to work free stuff and allowing them to leech off of you know the rest of us who work hard, right? Um, that's not actually what it means at all, and that's not how it works at all. Um, but I feel like the comic on the left really kind of uh, encapsulates this idea that the people with the most to lose with an economy that works for everyone have invested a lot of effort in making socialism a scary word for lots of people. They imply that it means a government that takes away individual rights or that promotes laziness because you don't have to fight to survive every single day. Whereas in reality, socialist economies today don't actually do those things. Um, on the top right, you'll see on Fox News an image that they showed that was designed to scare people away from this platform. But like really look at what a modern day socialist platform in America would include. It would include Medicare for all, housing as a human right, um, a federal jobs guarantee, immigration justice, mobilizing against climate change, um, campaign finance, higher education for all, women's rights, support for seniors, um, a curb of Wall Street gambling, all kinds of things that don't actually um, take away the wealth of society as a whole. In fact, the wealth of society as a whole would probably be enriched by a lot of these policies. But the myth that people are told often is that if we do this, our country will be poor. Whereas in reality, if we do this, maybe eight billionaires would be a little bit poor. But anyway, all that to say, we need to be careful about defining socialism when we talk about it with people, because often people have internalized a lot of these scary ideas and they don't really have a clear picture of what it is that it means. So to start, socialism. 
is an economic ideology that goes with a mixed economy. And we've already learned about a free market economy in which the government completely stays out of um, the economy, doesn't regulate it, doesn't tell businesses what to do, um, that sort of thing. In world geography, you learned about command economies as well. That's the opposite, where the state has full control to make all economic decisions, which can lead to abuse, authoritarian governments, and fewer rights for people. A mixed economy is like the Goldilocks zone right in the middle. In a mixed economy, the government steps in to make some economic decisions while leaving most economic activity to private businesses. So you can still start a business and supply and demand still tells you how to price your products and you can still decide what to make. But the government may set some regulations like you must pay your workers this much and they may tax your profits, like take some of the money that you earn and use that money to pay for services for everybody, just called redistributing wealth. Most states have mixed economies because free market economies all by themselves are horrible for workers and create massive inequality. And so most states already, including the United States, have several policies that could be considered socialist. Socialism is an ideology, right? It answers, why would we have a mixed economy? What's the goal? Socialism says, to promote social goals and reduce inequality, the government should create regulations like laws about how business can operate and taxation systems to fund some public goods like schools while leaving most businesses otherwise to run without government interference. The goal here is less inequality and a way to protect society as a whole. The key here is this wealth redistribution idea, usually via taxation, to provide basic services like healthcare, welfare systems, disability insurances, and stuff like that. Some key industries might be nationalized, which means state run, operated by the government for the public good. Um, we don't usually use this language in the United States, but there are a lot of businesses that are actually run by the government for the public good, like public schools, the military, police officer, uh, officers, um, libraries, that sort of thing. More socialist countries have more of those sorts of businesses. And people can still earn money from working or from owning businesses, but the government may tax rich people in order to give money to the poor. This is called redistribution. Under socialist systems, the economy produces what society wants as expressed by the free market, just like capitalism, but also the services that benefit society like schools or healthcare. And those services are planned centrally. Some services are for everybody. Some are priced based on the market. Another way of looking at that is on the sort of spectrum of economic ideologies from left to right, going from like least government involvement to the most. Under a capitalist system, there's as little government interference in the economy as possible. Private individuals and businesses, not the state, own businesses, own the factors of production and operate without government interference or rules in order to make a profit. And profit is really key for business owners. Socialism, on the other hand, promotes some government intervention into the economy. That's the main difference. The state should have a role in guiding the economy to different degrees. They do this to redistribute wealth via taxation in order to decrease or eliminate inequality and poverty and provide services. To regulate businesses, which means making rules and laws that protect workers, but also the public. So that could be like work safety laws, minimum wage laws, but also environmental protections. And they run some businesses for the public good, like universal health care, schools, the military, the fire department, police, libraries, public transportation, so forth. Capitalism in its pure form does not exist anymore. Most countries are a mix of capitalist and socialist policies. And the difference between different forms of socialism is how much the government gets involved to redistribute wealth, to promote more equality. Why would we want to do this? 
Well, let's look at the owner of Amazon, for example, Jeff Bezos. A lot of people get feelings about any talk about like taxing wealth to redistribute money to pay for things for everybody, right? But let's like look at how much money Jeff Bezos actually has. In one minute, he earns $149,000. That's an insane amount of money. Every second that goes by, he earns $2,500. It's hard for human brains to process numbers this big, but when we say that he's a millionaire, he's worth $113 billion, Jeff Bezos. $113 billion. The medium household income in the US last year was about $62,000. So someone making that much could work for 1.5 million years, spend none of it, and still not have as much money as the owner of Amazon. Um, so when we talk about taxing the rich, we're talking about taxing an insane amount of wealth that already exists to redistribute it so that we can all profit from different public services. Or at least that's what the key idea of most socialist policies involves. The thing about socialism is it does involve changing the economic system because it changes the goal. Instead of having an entire economy geared towards making profit for businessmen, like under capitalism, under socialist economies, the goal is public welfare for society as a whole, as a group. So cooperation is the value that replaces competition. Socialism takes on many forms throughout history, kind of on a spectrum of how much equality the government steps in to promote. So some versions of socialism are pretty extreme. Um, the most extreme version of socialism is called communism. We'll get to that in the next lesson. Some versions are less extreme, probably like what exists in the United States. But at its core, the belief that underlies all of them is that the state, the government, should play some role in decreasing inequality by redistributing the wealth that we generate through industrial um, systems. Defining features of socialism include a commitment to some sort of egalitarian society. So if not perfectly equal, they want to reduce inequality. It involves a relatively optimistic view of people and their ability to cooperate with each other, kind of more John Locke than Hobbes, if we remember our Enlightenment thinkers. So it rejects the idea that competition is the prime and only motivation governing human behavior and says, hey, we can cooperate to make life better for all of us. As a result of socialism and labor unions working together, there was slow but significant progress that continues to this day that helped make life less terrible for the working class. Governments passed regulations supporting labor unions in most parts of the industrialized world. However, the United States is an exception, and in some states, it's even illegal for some sectors of business to form labor unions and go on strike, like teachers, for example. Um, but back then, a lot of states did support labor unions and pass regulations protecting them. Um, they banned child labor, they established minimum wages and maximum working hours, safety regulations, lots of things. Then throughout the 20th century, governments across the industrialized world were able to create public education systems. A lot of places developed public health care systems, tax systems to help the poor, and different versions of welfare and social security. Socialist governments were much more successful in Europe. Most of Western Europe is to a much greater degree more socialistic than the United States. But even though the United States has this identity based on individualism and capitalism, we actually also adopted a lot of socialist ideas and do to different degrees redistribute wealth. I'll give you a few examples of how it looks in different places. So in the United States, we have free kindergarten to 12th grade public school. There are minimum wage laws. There are welfare systems and unemployment insurance and workplace safety laws and stuff like that. 
Um, however, it's an incredibly limited system because in this country at the moment, you can work a 40 hour work week at minimum wage and still not have enough to live on and still be living under the poverty line. Um, we do not have any sort of universal health care. So in this country, health insurance companies are run for profit. As a result, having a baby, something like as natural to the human race as there could possibly be, here it costs thousands of dollars. Whereas in other countries with universal health care, that sort of thing is free. Um, there's also radical inequality in this country. I mean, we have billionaires and we just learned what that means exactly. And at the same time, we have homeless people and veterans on the streets and people have completely normalized that sort of existence. France has more socialist policies than we do. So they have universal health care. If you get sick, you go to the hospital, you don't get a bill at all. And the doctors are fine. I lived there for a while. I know that there's a myth that like somehow universal health care is less good or terrible or um, inferior to what we have in the United States. But in my experience, it was actually a lot better and faster. They have free higher education. Um, people's most basic needs are generally covered. There are unemployment be benefits that are good enough to at least have a roof over your head and some food. It's not enough to live comfortably, but you'll survive. And they have maternity leave paid. Finland is a great example of a very socialist country, and they have some policies that are just kind of even hard to imagine. So they have everything that France has. Plus, for example, when you have a baby, the state sends you a box full of baby supplies. Um, there are free classes for anyone to take to learn anything they're interested in, like languages, crafts, cooking, etc. Just imagine a society where people can learn as much as they want for free and like pursue their interests. There are public bathrooms in Finland and they include a big stall with showers and materials. So like worst case scenario, you can get a shower and be clean. Um, there are baby changing stations that come stocked with free diapers, you know, stuff like that, that in the United States, difficult to imagine. So long story short, socialism comes in very different forms and proposes to address the inequalities that come out of a capitalist system by harnessing the wealth that society creates and putting it to the use of society as a whole, not just to line the pockets of the business owners. And now we come to the key points. So if you could please make sure to get all of this information in your notes. Today we learned about two different ways that developed to reform industrial capitalism. First, labor unions, which found power in the numbers of workers. Labor unions secured better working conditions when workers organized themselves as a group and advocated for themselves through collective bargaining, strikes, and democratic reform. Collective bargaining is when workers negotiate what they need as a group rather than individually. And then they can go on strike if the workers union and the boss don't agree on terms. Labor unions can also apply political pressure as a voting block to get political change passed. So you could say like you've lost, you know, the teachers union, teachers aren't going to vote for you if you don't actually make school safe by, I don't know, making windows openable during COVID pandemic crisis or something like that. Labor unions seek change at the industry level, so they don't require a huge change to government or to economic systems and they can be kind of hard to organize and they can cause change in localized areas. So they're limited in their ability to cause big systematic change. However, on the plus side, they can cause reform without having to revolutionize the capitalist system as a whole. Socialism, on the other hand, proposes to replace capitalism with a better economic system better from the point of view of socialists, of course, but an economic system that works for society as a whole. A good definition for socialism to just kind of keep in mind and have on hand includes three characteristics. Socialism proposes more government intervention in the economy to redistribute wealth, usually by taxation, 
to decrease inequality and poverty and to provide social services like unemployment insurance, welfare. They also want the state more involved in the economy to regulate businesses, so to make rules and laws that protect workers and the public, like work safety laws, minimum wage laws, and environmental protections. And they want the state involved in the government in the economy more so that the state can run some businesses for the public good instead of for private profit, like universal health care, schools, military, fire department, police, libraries, public transportation, and so forth. Socialism seeks reform by changing the structures of capitalism itself and how the government interacts with business. It seeks to use society's wealth to benefit society as a whole instead of just the business owner. And it seeks to replace the capitalist survival of the fittest or competition-based system with one that works based on cooperation for the common good. So more systemic change. So pause here, take notes, but then press play again because there are a couple of questions on the next slide. Wrapping up for the day, um, please respond to the following. One, define socialism in your own words in a way that somebody who did not take this class might actually understand what it is. Do the same for labor unions and then respond to the following questions. How are these two similar? How are they different? And how does each aim to fix some of the problems raised by industrial era capitalism? 